wrong snap. Oh, ah, shit. Ah, so close. Yeah. Anyway, welcome, guys, to episode uh, 15 of The Weekly. And with me, of course, are my usual uh, hosts. Signing off with uh, Mr. Juan Bagnell from uh, Park. Oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We're all managing that transition. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, if I have to answer the, why aren't you doing videos on Pocket No anymore question, like, one more time, I'll, I'll like, I don't know, I'll cry or something. Okay. So. And, of course, uh, Sam, a.k.a. Black Iron underscore man. How's it going, man? Uh, still can't hear still you, Sam. No audio from Sam. But we'll get Sam fixed. Don't worry about that. He'll be joining the conversation with his jazzy, dulcet tones. Exactly. So let us kick things off. Uh, a lot of news this week. Uh, I'm sure I missed some. So if you guys have anything extra, uh, let me know. Uh, uselessness. I don't know if there's one particular uselessness um this week but i'd like to get into something that i think you know will be will turn very messy pretty soon Next no week. i mean like our first story on the rundown is like the future uselessness yeah lots of messiness coming up facebook date or facebook's dating service which will be tied into your facebook not a separate app it's something no. you can no to. just just a part of facebook yeah, just a part of Facebook. Uh, yeah. What What do you think the Vegas odds are? What's the over under on this being something you have to, you have to opt out of? Like, how many people do you think are going to get in trouble because they don't really pay attention to their Facebook settings? Yeah, I mean, I I, I hope this is an opt in. I mean, if it's sensible, please just make it an opt in. You know, <laughs> not an opt out. <laughs> like, but, but as soon as they see, you know, like, oh, well, your relationship status says that you're single or it's complicated. So here are lovely singles in your. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Facebook is taking that true AI assistance. It reminds me of a Black Mirror episode. Mm -hmm. um, oh, God, season four, I believe, where um, there was a there was a dating app that basically went through a million uh computations to find out the right person so facebook is trying to help you do that making your life yeah. easier to totally totally altruistically with no motive no design mm -hmm. no no nothing nefarious running in the background no way to profit off this it's it's incredible that facebook would be this giving well to me it's, that's not even the part that um i'm concerned about really actually mine is just the messy nature i mean this thing could get really sloppy real quick Oh, oh no, it, it's it's a guarantee <laughs> that it's gonna get really sloppy. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah you're back. It, it's a guarantee that it's that it's gonna be really sloppy because Facebook exists through the momentum of apathy. And people don't really utilize Facebook and all of the services and all the privacy settings and all of the controls because they just sort of run on the momentum of all my family and friends are on Facebook, so I have to be on Facebook too. Making a part of Facebook's algorithm and a part of Facebook's friend sorting business built on romance, built on this this uh, dating application is going to get really hairy for a lot of people out there, especially folks more accustomed, I think, to an online casual dating experience now it's tied into something that all of your family and friends reference it's going to be tied into a lot of your other online behaviors and and there's no way that it's not going to get ugly for people yeah but it doesn't a lot of these dating apps i know one you know nothing whatsoever about this anyway but uh, it's like <laughs> only from from like uh listening to other people talk about how terrible they are yeah, but a lot of these apps, um, don't they use Facebook as almost their logging anyway? So yeah. I'm just thinking these apps are going to, uh, there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs out there, a lot of creators out there who are going to be pissed off. Well, match that, 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 yeah, yeah. that Facebook yeah. is now jumping into the arena. And you see, this is, this, we've said this already several times. When you build your company, in any way on someone else's platform. This is what you open yourself up to. And Facebook has done this with multiple different companies and is doing this again with dating. So just think about any app out there that you use for, that's a dating app right now. The logging structure is normally just Facebook. <laughs> logging with Facebook. <laughs> yeah. So now it's like, if Facebook has its own dating service, why go outside of Facebook and use a different app? Totally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also it's, like the the Amazon model too. Like you can sell your products on Amazon through like some sort of Amazon store setup, and then if you if you become successful in a certain area, then Amazon just sort of replicates your business model and puts you out of business. And this is the exact same thing. If you have a process, uh, you you can't 
you can't lock down a process. You know, you can make short videos on any platform. You don't need a, a whole separate app just to do short video sharing because everyone can rip off what might be a popular process. And algorithmic matching and sorting and friend filtering, well, there there's an app for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear you guys, but like again, I'm, you guys are missing the part that I'm calling messy. I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm not talking. About, I'm talking about people. I'm talking about no, how messy no. it is. It's going to be. I mean, like because you know all the dating apps, whether it's Tinder, whether it's like well, the they Google they exist Google. somewhere that doesn't broadcast everything. Exactly you, right. You know, yeah, I, I, I knew where you were going with that. <laughs> I'm just going for the messy man. I'm going for straight up. Messy. It, 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 it's okay. Just, just just make sure you have your undercover Facebook account that is not linked to oh. friends. Oh. Just, just make sure you, you have think, one. Of do you them. think that there is any possibility? <laughs> do you think that there is any hope? that Facebook might become a legitimate relationship sorting service as opposed to a casual hookup service. Cause I don't see any part of internet culture embracing this in a way that would make it legitimately like, this is the resource I use to try and find a long-term long lasting relationship. I mean, I, 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 I think, think it's possible, can, yeah. but it's, it's a matter of, will they actually set it up the right way? Right. <laughs> That, if, if there was any is. company that could, I think Facebook would be the one that probably could do it. Because if you think about it, this is where your family and friends are. So you already opening open up to basically having, just imagine if Facebook opened up a, a feature that said, you know, uh, introduce a friend. So let's say you have a cousin that has a friend that thinks, you know, you two would really, you know, sync up real well. You two will have like a really great connection. That's an awesome feature. Because that's how naturally, that's how most people meet through introduction from family and friends. So Facebook has that little, um, they might have a little bit of a, um, a, a of an upper hand in the dating game if they introduce features like that. If it's not just a random, I, I, I see this person that's connected to someone else that I like, so I'm just gonna, you know, poke them on Facebook. No, it's, it's, it's it, if, they, if they make it more of a community thing where people are actually pushing that introduction yeah, then something it could really work. It could be something that turns into a you know su sustainable relationships. I mean, yeah, it's actually, I, I, you know, I, I instead like of poking, that. it would be hilarious if you could add a grandmother feature. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. I think I've got I've got the perfect I've got the perfect mate for my grandchild, yeah. and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell Facebook, and Facebook is gonna crunch the numbers on how compatible they are. Yeah. And then that'll be the invite. So so it's just like when you're, you're, you know, your, your grandparents are trying to find like a good partner for you and they just try and hook you up with yeah. people. And now you could be facilitated. Oh, well, Cindy's boy is just such a nice gentleman. I think he'd be perfect for you. Now, and then she can go in and punch that into Facebook <laughs> and, and make that like the official recommendation. That would, be, that would actually be funny. Though. That would, actually be, funny. <laughs> that right? would be kind of awesome. <laughs> I'd be a lot more excited about that. I mean, also, also, also it would be nice if, and I know they won't do this, if, um, you know, you know, there's one aspect of saying introduction, right, for friends. And then there's an the aspect of you looking, because people look at other friends, you know, friends list, and you need permission to talk yeah. to that friend, especially if you're not friends. You're like, you add, and then it sends a message to say Juan is like, hey, Juan, um, I would like to talk to your friend. You know, it's like you know, a chaperone mode. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, is man. it okay? <laughs> well, if you think about it, people would be a lot more on uh, uh, on their best behavior if they did stuff like that. Oh, no, but it also yeah. would save you too. Besides the best behavior, they'd be like, nah, bro, that is just not for you. Like, trust me, stay away. It's I'm just this is for your own good, you know, that kind of thing. This is somebody better, you know, that helps out. But again, that's us doing wishful thinking in Facebook. Yeah, no, I, I, I really All think this. that the first steps on this are going to be ugly and brutal, even for just dating apps. Uh, my brother was telling me about a friend of his who he's now in a long term relationship, but he never deleted his profile oh off of one of these dating apps. <laughs> but 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 he didn't I mean, like he's a really smart kid, but he didn't really get he just deleted the app from his phone. Oh, yeah. And so someone else found his profile on this dating app while he was supposedly in this long term relationship. And it caused this minor like two day friend back talking strife before anyone really approached him about it. Like, yo, dude, what's going on with your profile on Tinder? And he's like, oh, oh, no, I don't use it anymore. I'm with I'm with so and so. And then like it, it kind of blew up in his face. Now, imagine that compounded by how Facebook broadcasts and tracks everything that you do on that platform it's, it's guaranteed to be super super ugly 
Oh yeah, uh, when it first launches. Definitely. I was talking to David, the unlocker, and he's like, "Oh, this is this is great. I, I might try it out." I was like, "I have stayed out of this one. Oh, I have yeah. stayed out of this messy zone. You know, I like I'd rather go back to those separate dating apps, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to stay in here because it's just goes the potential to screw up your personal circle, circle is, is high, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, and no and one wants to mess with that. And if you're a woman, I just I, I can't see how this isn't just an automatic dick pic service. I just oh. don't see how you just don't get inundated. You know what? I really didn't realize how bad it was until <laughs> talking to one of the uh, one of the uh, what we what people we call the geeks in uh, in New York, right? So fellow geeks in New York, and she gets unsolicited dick pics. I'm like, what yeah. kind of guy just? Hey, Here's I like this drunk. girl. Hey, yeah, she's probably that, gonna like my dick. Is, is, there you go. It, it's, like, it, it's, it's like the, the most absurdly technological primate thing you could do. Well, I couldn't throw my feces at her, so here's my dick. <laughs> that makes now that makes a lot of sense. Right? <laughs> it's like because there's no possible way that could work. Even if you're playing the numbers, you know, and people say you know, like, "Oh, you just put yourself out there, and you're gonna get rejected a thousand times." But if if it works once, it worked. And you're like, well, it's like, it's a guaranteed zero success rate. No one yeah. is looked at that dick pic and got, yes, for me, that's what I'm all about. That's the person he wants. Yeah. Up. He took, oh. he took, he took the up. initiative. He's ambitious. He's a go-getter. No, okay. okay. He's, gonna, he's obviously going to succeed in life if he opens he's up. He's going to be a good provider. <laughs> that is so not true. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, if you guys check in the, uh, I just sent you in the chat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this, this uh, also, this also fits the, this uh, is, the yeah. So Lou sent, it. thank you. Lou. Lou sent it to me. It's like, I sent it to you already, man. Sorry. It's a uh, uselessness for the week. Uh, this is uh, Comcast aims to combat court courting by limiting major internet speeds <laughs> increases to cable surprise, uh, surprise, uh, surprise. Yeah, I, I, I forgot about this one. I even yeah. tweeted this out. And yeah. uh, again, we, we shouldn't be surprised from one of the the what is it consistently one of the top voted companies for consumer dissatisfaction. I mixed my meta my negatives there. Improperly, but <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, like basically the company that everybody hates to hate um, doing yet another thing that's scummy and evil and villainous and should we be surprised because they typically don't face any competition in the areas where they pull off this kind of uh, practice but wait isn't 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 um basically this just what competition looks like you know since net neutrality apparently is is anti-competitive this is exactly what competition should look like right Totally. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, like, it, it's all about having choice. And when you have no choice, well, then the company essentially needs to compete against itself. Yeah. <laughs> make, make the people who already pay for, for, for Internet service probably pay a little more to get what they want. Because, hey, your, your, your consumer is a cattle and you just keep on yeah. milking them for everything you want. Totally. Um, and, and that's good because if you don't milk a cow, they could be in distress, right? Yeah, definitely. You could be really yeah. uncomfortable yeah. if you don't milk yeah. that cow. So yeah, it, it, in fact, it's, it's, it's terrible that other companies don't do this. Exactly. In fact, we should be celebrating Comcast. Oh yeah. I, I, totally, total competitiveness. This is just, this is this alpha. Is alpha total competitiveness. <laughs> <laughs> they like, compete with everyone and themselves. Just like World War II was total war. This is <laughs> total, total competitiveness. War. Oh my but this God. is this is this is this is really truly um, the nightmare when you remove yeah. the internet as a, um, uh, a, a, a as a service, an infrastructure service, as yeah. a utility. When, when you take that away, this is what we're left with. We're, we're left with people saying we have X amount of consumers. We have a limited amount of uh, you know of outreach. We don't want to go out and put money out for R and D to attract new consumers. So what are we going to yeah. do? We're going to milk the consumers we already have. We're going to make the people who are already paying absurd amounts for internet service. We're going to make them pay even more to get even less. And, that's and, and we're already talking about people in a lot of these areas who are already underserved for more competitive internet yeah. service. So Comcast has no financial incentive to improve broadband capabilities in a lot of these areas. Now, uh, this is this is exactly where I get twitchy and conservative because I really do feel we have a problem with regulation at the city and state level. This is exactly one of those situations where if you could get to local politicians and start moving the needle on some of these state laws that prevent multiple players in an area 
from actually competing or setting up co-ops. You know, there are a lot of rural internet co-ops that do a great job of fulfilling service to people that major mega corporations refuse to serve. This is an area where you could actually put up, you know, you know, vote with your wallet if we didn't have state and city regulations that stood in the way. So it, it's one of those things where it's it's hard not to get a little soapboxy and political. But yet again, congratulations, Comcast, as if we needed yet another data point that you will always act in the most truly evil fashion you can. You always manage at least once a month to give us a headline that reinforces that idea. It, it, I, I mean, like I'm almost impressed. It's just the way they do it as, as well. Look, just think about the way they're actually doing this. They're going about it and saying, oh, if you order, so basically if you order cable from Comcast, so if, if, if you order cable from Comcast, you get access to higher tiers of cable, of, of, of internet speeds. Now, basically, if you read that the other way, it basically says, we're going to basically stifle every other internet provider or internet TV provider um, if, you know, you to any customer who doesn't pay for our particular TV service. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's totally anti-competitive. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is it, it, it totally flies in the face to me. If, if we're making a good faith conservative argument about the business libertarianism competition, this to me would be an extreme data point for why we need some light touch to come in there and really examine how businesses ha hold influence over politicians at every tier from city government all the way up to the federal government. And that's what we should be taking a look at. Net neutrality actually won't move the needle on this to any significant degree other than letting Comcast wipe out the actual services online through these sort of uncompetitive business practices. But they wouldn't be able to do this if you could take your money out of Comcast and put it into a competitor who isn't going to do that. Mm -hmm. Every area where you have more than one provider you don't see the same aggressive uh, practices in trying to halt that kind of competition because consumers have the ability to take their money away. If you're in a Google Fiber neighborhood, you know <laughs> the other entrenched ISPs are not playing this game the same way. No, that's, that's very true. I mean, but we're not surprised about any of these announcements by Comcast. So. No, it, you know, it's it's yet another this this entire year in terms of politics and tech has been not surprised, <laughs> still disappointed. Gonna <laughs> just keep gonna keep throwing that like I need like a giant rubber stamp. Not surprised, still disappointed. Uh, I would agree. I would definitely agree. All right, let's move on to some VR, some low-cost VR, something that Juan's very, uh, very interested in. Um, Oculus Go came out today. Uh, not today, this week. So which is the low-cost entry to Oculus. Uh, mm -hmm. It's cost $199, uh, 32 gigabytes, 249 for the 64 gigabyte version. Um, I'm a bit bummed out in terms of it's a standalone headset. It is powered by the Snapdragon 821 processor. So this is actually a much older processor um, out there. But um, it's really nice and slick. You can throw it up and use. Um, and it's Oculus way to get people into that um, um, entry level headset arena. Similar also, uh, Lenovo announced their Daydream headset, which is the Mirage, which is this bad boy here. Um, this is powered by, with, with Daydream, and they worked in conjunction with Google. It's powered by an 835 processor, and also it's priced at 199 I believe storage is 64 gigabytes. So there are options for people there, in, especially in that low-cost range. Um, they both have the six degrees of motion, which allows you to uh, move around uh, at least a certain distance, and you don't get dizzy. You can look underneath an object. You can look around an object. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I hadn't actually looked up the, the Oculus. I was trying to read up more on the Lenovo, but, um, again, it's another step in the right direction. What I'll be curious to see is, will we continue to see this sort of bifurcation between mobile powered VR and things like, like I was just kind of joking, but when you said low cost VR, I, was, I, I held up the Acer, the mixed reality headset as that sort of another in the mid range, inexpensive way to plug VR into a computer. Yeah. And that's what I'm kind of curious to see is 
right now we still have these little islands of oculus versus microsoft versus vive versus gear yeah. versus daydream and it's a little hard i think for consumers to get a toehold on where they want to go even 200 dollars isn't an extravagant purchase but it's not an impulse buy you are thinking what am i going to use this for how am i going to use it and will it grow with me for a while and that's i think just enough rational thought to kind of give some consumers who would otherwise run right in and get something cool to give them just enough pause to maybe not pull the trigger on something just yet but then we play the wait and see game and just like you know every other technology that's withered on the vine we have to worry will we see enough people embracing the space to really move the needle on next gen vr uh sam any thoughts um, I'm still getting used to the whole idea of VR. You know, I'm 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 not a big fan of anything you have to place over your head, any accessory you need to basically either play games or watch TV or whatever. But I would say just a few, what, I think it's two weeks now since I've had the Oculus Rift. I have enjoyed it immensely. It's um, it, it's very good. So I would, I would think that lowering the cost of entry to people is, is a good idea, would force people to make games that have better graphics, would force people to make games that are more interactive, would force people to think differently about how they make games. But um, right now, just the options out there, I don't know really what differentiates all of these like is, is is it pixel density is it is it resolution what what, what is what is it exactly you know separates a um you know an oculus go from a lenovo mirage to to, to uh, from a oculus rift from a uh, htc vive um from a htc five two what, what is the selling feature what is the differentiator between all of these and right now i don't think it's really clear for a lot of people you mm -hmm. know I, well, I, I, I think between the easiest differentiator is that, you know, between the top tier and the lower tier, of course, is power. Um, PC connected power gives you better resolution, graphics, and also more freedom. That frame rate. Yeah, and freedom of movement. Um, uh, I made a mistake. I am not sure if the Oculus Go has six degrees of, of movement. I know mm. the Mirage does because that is something. So when I talk to Lenovo and Google, Google guys, they talked about how they were trying their idea with this especially you know powered by daydream is to make it as quick as possible to get into vr so setup time with the title was 10 minutes it took me maybe about eight or so all you have to do is sign into wi-fi and uh they already games on there or you can sign into your google play account and then download some more games and you know stuff like that um the thing i would say is that the six degree of motion really works there was one game um i played which is just snowball you're throwing snowballs at kids <laughs> um and it's what's right cool up your alley yeah what's cool about it is that once you know a kid will throw a snowball you could actually just do this you can sidestep like that with your headset and you know you know especially when you're thinking about headsets like this which are not tethered to your pc and don't have sensors all around because yeah. they use the two cameras in the front just like uh, the mixed reality headsets to give mm -hmm. you positional analysis as well. So those kind of things are what they're talking about. They also talked about watching movies on there. And he said, you know, and people have talked about that. You know, you can watch a hundred inch screen on there. So I fired up, you know, my favorite movie, Man of Steel, which I have <laughs> um, on Google Play. And uh, yeah. One is like, you and, just called that your favorite movie. You just messed with him, didn't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I had to, I had to. Yeah. Uh, but it was cool to actually fire it up and you could see like the 100 inch screen uh, right in front of you, um, which is which is good. So so those kind of things, I think, are some of the differentiators. It's just a matter of them, these companies telling and expressing those differentiators. And then there's also that one aft section that, you know, Lenovo has with the Star Wars lightsaber, like on its own. That has nothing to do with the said VR experience. That's more of an AR experience, but also that's tied to your phone. So. Yeah, it's interesting that that Lenovo, I think, is the only company, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they're pushing an AR solution, they're pushing VR their solution. VR all-in-one solution, and they also came out with a mixed reality. Headset. Yep, they have all three solutions available for you. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's like they're, they're trying to cover all bases. Again, it, it is one of the disappointments, though, where you... You hear about like a really cool VR game and then you go and pick it up and it's like platform exclusives. Oh, well, it's not going to play on this hardware. And you're like, yeah. well, damn, that's like something I really wanted to try.
Um, I, 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 I keep impressing people by having them spend a, a couple minutes playing around with super hot, super hot VR has been oh, one of the best, an like game. it's, it's, it's so much fun and it's barely more than like a tech demo of what you can do with VR. And yet it, it it's like the most immediate, easiest to translate. This is, this is what you can feel like when you're playing this game, but it also just doesn't really have the staying power, I think, to convince other people to jump on board. And we need to see that um, that expands. So like, if if I could be playing more of the uh, what is it, Spurios? Like, um, God, what's the, I, the name of the game? The they're they're all into like almost fitness VR uh, that they they run you so hard in their games. They're going to be the developers that are going to make the Creed VR game. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Like your 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 punches at you, like the 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 speed and strength of your punches actually transfers to your character. So how hard you punch in real life is how hard your character is going to punch in the game, kind of a thing. Um, it, it's like when it, when you see stuff like that, that's awesome. But then I try and you know, like that's not going to play on my Acer. You know that that they don't they haven't made their their games available for that platform. Sam, if you get a chance, download Eve Valkyrie uh, and play that. Oh, okay. That is that to me. That was the one game um, that I, when I got the Vive, not the Vive, sorry, uh, the Oculus Rift, that really sold it. Now it can get expensive because to truly enjoy the game, if you get the flight rig with it, it is, <laughs> it is unbelievable. It literally, yeah. you feel like um, you're in, uh, you know, whether it's a Tie Fighter, an X Wing, whatever ship you want to imagine yourself in, because. The first thing you notice is, I, I guarantee you, you fall for this, is you, they shoot you out of the launcher, you're in this huge battle zone, and then this massive spaceship just comes by you. And you can see the large letterings that says UNS, and you're like, okay, this is, this is a big world. And that's the kind of, to me, that's the kind of game that got me hooked. And I said, okay, yes, I like this, but I haven't seen this kind of games anymore. That was the only game that's that massive. Everything else has been like uh, super super short VR, a uh, little more than tech demos per se that uh, mm -hmm. are great, but not Robo enough. Recall is pretty good. Robo Recall, uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of like super hot. Doesn't have the movement feature, but you can break off pieces of these robots and basically beat them with it. So you can grab a robot, rip off its hands, use that hand beat another robot to death and then chuck the other robot at another one. It's 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 pretty fun stuff. Uh, but yeah, no, Elite Dangerous is the same way like uh, uh like yeah, it's it's Elite Dangerous is another very immersive stuff. I think I tried that at a friend of ours place, Ken, when um when we went to Chicago and that yeah. was really cool. Like just the whole idea that you're that you spend half the time just looking around like, oh my God, I can see the ships behind me and I can see the ships in front of me. And it's it's it, I normally don't like space um fighter games. But um, when you're in that environment I like that, that, it makes it a lot easier for me to get my spatial awareness. Yeah, trust board. me, with Eve Valkyrie, the coolest thing is shooting missiles. Like you're tracking the ship and he's going off your, your rank and you just go, look, fire. You're like, done. I don't need to aim. I don't need to put my cursor because as long as my, my eyesight is on that guy and then... I started thinking of uh, Battlestar Galactica and how they were doing fight scenes in space. And I was like, okay, if I flip right this way, <laughs> maybe I'll be able to catch that guy. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it can be a fun experience. And uh, hopefully, uh, at least on the lower tier, I can, I can understand the separation, separation between Vive and um, um, Oculus in terms of uh, giving that separation for uh, different types of content on the high end. Uh, you know, you want exclusives. But I think when you get down to that $200 price range, I think we should be able to get content that's, you know, immersive all around. Whether it's on, you know, the Daydream, whether it's Oculus Go, whether it's on Gear VR, stuff like that, that it should be you know, an all around experience. So. I just think, it, at least it's worth mentioning that we're talking about devices that could go all the way from like 199 all the way up to like close to eight nine hundred dollars and at the end of the day it's just when you look at it it's the experience like i said the experience to me isn't that much different uh, of course you get better graphics on the uh, on the headset that are tethered to your computer but the whole idea that you can still get a great experience on a sub 300 dollars device that's amazing 
that's a device that's mostly being run from your phone. <laughs> that is yeah. really amazing. Well, uh, but isn't that also one of the concerns is, is what are we seeing developers do to take advantage of some of this, this more impressive hardware? And it's, it, it is becoming a bit of a challenge to express, you know, like you look at a Vive Pro and what it is that it brings to the table is really formidable. But we're so new into the world of VR that developers haven't really tapped that yet. So you, you also run the risk of someone playing with a $200 headset and going like, well, that was really great. And then getting the Vive Pro and it's like, oh, well, that was a little bit better. How much does this cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. The uh, Vive Pro that I'm disappointed it wasn't wireless, um, especially with the with the talk of uh, wireless. Although, like, uh, I know you saw it, Sam, right? Well, yeah, I think, did the Vive say they were going to... Uh, Vive said they were. a wireless um, adapter or something? Yeah, yeah. They, they were, but in, I thought the Vive Pro was going to be that. We, we had the Vive team on Newegg now, so it's, it's going to be sort of a separate component. So you yeah. can have your Vive Pro experience, and then for an additional uh, fee, then you'd be looking at some sort of wireless uh, connector to sort of minimize that cable but i don't know they, they didn't have any word on when, when where how yeah. much anything like that yeah because because to me especially on that experience especially with the vive and even the oculus uh, rift is you know when you're given that much room and space to play then you know you start noticing the wires yourself at some point you're playing the game you're enjoying it, and you're like okay i wish i could just like move fully right and not you yeah. know bother about yanking my cable and my head off yeah. at the same time so but they're really cool to have it. wireless sensors as well as uh you know the wireless uh, headset as well because this the, is this... also i mean because we've had a number of people in the chat talking about how could we make more of a holodeck collaborative or interactive experience with multiple players and this is the arms race is are we really going to have banks of PCs communicating wirelessly to headsets for multiple players to all interact in the same space? Or are you just going to wear all that stuff in the headset? You know, like HoloLens or, um, or like some of the work that Qualcomm is doing with using mobile processors, oh, ARM-based nice. processors to try and uh, produce this. Now, what's actually going to move the needle on getting people to... Uh, to to buy that gear, to use that gear, or to put it up in places where other consumers can experience it, like a laser tag style arena. Do you want people running around with backpacks? Probably not, but we've seen a few of those arcades pop up. Now we could go to really expensive PCs wirelessly connecting to devices. Do we have the range? Do we have the connectivity? Do, can we work out interference issues with all of that wire, uh, with all of that signal in the air? Or do we just want to strap a couple things to people's heads Give them one little puck controller in their hands and let them go to go to town deathmatch style. And I think mobile will probably win for the vast majority of consumer experiences. Yep. I do agree. Yeah, the the whole the whole idea of having the mobile processor to do that, uh, especially if it's a standalone headset, where I know that um, if we are playing um, some kind of like Call of Duty tag game, and I'll have to just just bring this headset, walk up there, and I'm good. And you know we're in an arena where we're all playing. Is I I can bring my own headset, or I can pick a headset up there, and you know, we're good to go. Plus, I'm already signed into my account, so basically yeah. we now have that online multiplayer. You know, app yeah, but, but I think at the end of the day, it ends up being if anyone here has, like I've seen the um, Ready Player One um, kind of environment, it ends up being that. Like we we, we don't need the Hollow Deck because the Hollow Deck is really what we enter once we put that headset on. Right, you put the headset on, and you have you can you, you can have a multiplayer environment uh, in VR. You don't need to move to a specific location to do that. You just basically are in your location with your setup, and someone else is in their location with their setup, and you just enjoy a shared VR experience. Well, I mean that's on the VR side of things, but if you're looking at maybe the VR and AR combined together, where you know you've seen those, um, I've, I don't know if you've seen those videos where they create like certain zones or like it's almost like a, a, a world map of like a you know different ridges and, and barricades and stuff like that, and you're moving and the objects you're fighting are not real, of course they're AR. So it's kind of like Hololens where stuff pops up, but you're now in that you know, war style environment because it's created for you. And that puts your physical and your virtual in the same place. So, I mean, you can mix and match. It all depends on, you know, which ones consumers find the most interactive at the end of the day, right? Um, and it could be just the pure VR experience of staying at home and going, I put my headset on or 
or even um, it's just a pair of glasses, you know, like it's just a pair of Iron Man glasses and you're done. That's it, you know, that, that kind of cool. thing. So. So I think, and, and, and again, I, I seriously doubt we'll get to like hard light holograms before we just get to some kind of neural interface instead. Yeah. You know, like re really, if you think about it, technology is every step that technology takes is towards interacting closer and closer and closer to the body, and eventually it'll just be inside the body. Yeah. Like eventually, it's just going to make that that shift. Yeah. All right. Let's shift to the LG G7 ThinQ. LG You're welcome. 7. Brand new device. Um, uh, did you get a chance to see the press events, uh, Sam and? Um... Uh, no, oh, I yeah, uh, yeah. I saw. I saw the event, and I'm read up on the phone. I just haven't gotten to hold one yet. So, yeah, LG. Not like I've not been a fan of your phones or anything. Jerks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So here, here's the phone. In it's not cheap. glossy, glossy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you can you can of course hide the notch um, if you want to. It's something that you're allowed to do by going to. <laughs> you're allowed to do. <laughs> it's called. I mean, just listen to how resigned and like how defeated we are. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, they, they so... actually let you hide this design feature that no one seems to be really positive about. All black. Oh. I can colorize it. You know, make it like that. You know, make it big oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so that's that's the device. The whole thing on AI camera, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing nineteen nineteen different AI perceived scenes or stuff like that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a really light phone. I will give you this. Like in terms of uh, build, it is light and is well built. This is you know this is a this is a much better build than G six and definitely the G five. As we all know. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, G5 shouldn't ever be, <laughs> be in the context of a modern, polished, yeah. well-built phone. I, um, but but again, it's it's what I think is kind of curious is at some point, I think LG should pull the plug on having two, two different two. phone lines. So, you know, so like, speaking, of, speaking of that, though, AT&T is not carrying the G7. Yeah. Because AT&T is getting a variant of the V called the LG V35. Mm -hmm. coming to AT&T. So the, G the G7 will probably be carried by two carriers in the US, Verizon and T-Mobile, because we all know Sprint is now T-Mobile. So I thought it was an interesting move. AT&T can get very persnickety when a phone doesn't do well from a manufacturer that they'll sort of pull support for future phones unless they can get some kind of an exclusive. I think this is a big misstep for AT&T because they're going with the older phone. And in our market, that just never seems to do well. You know, it, it, it would be kind of like, um, what was that HTC that was on Sprint that was using the Qualcomm 810 because of some Sprint radio nonsense? It was the first HTC that they properly got rid of the headphone jack. Mm -hmm. Anyway, oh, it, like, it, yeah. no big surprise that a phone with completely outdated specs like sold very poorly on the fourth place carrier with no advertising and no branding. I, I kind of feel like V35, unfortunately for AT&T will sort of reinforce, well, you know, LGs don't sell. And you're like, well, yeah, because you're not carrying the current LG. True. How's it going, Warren? It's going okay. Cool. All right. Thank you for joining us. But oh, yeah, no, so no, 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 no. regardless, what I, what I think is is kind of is kind of interesting is watching how the G has has consistently step by step approached what you do with the V, and the V has become prettier and prettier. And, and I really think it would be to LG's benefit to stop trying to do dual phone launches and instead make it a big little launch towards the end of the year with the iPhone. You have a big V, a little V, and you just you only have to worry about advertising supporting. Um, releasing, announcing one batch of phones, and towards the end of the year, when you've had enough time to properly work out all the kinks with the new chipset, with new features, with new software, and it should give you a bit more bandwidth to properly support your products too. I think launching this phone so late in the year is going to be a lot of pressure on their timetable if and when we get word on the V40. No, I, I do agree. I also think the, the one, like we saw with this launch announcement, there was no price. 
but more importantly, there was no release date. And oh, that boy. Was, that and is we only have, it, hasn't this always been one of LG's major problems? We're going to tell you about the phone, and we won't tell you how much it's going to cost, and we won't tell you where it's going to go, and we won't tell you when you can get it. So then, by the time it's actually out, we've we've completely moved on. Like, the phone market has completely moved oh, on, and no one's <laughs> waiting for it. This month is, is a fast month for moving on because uh, OnePlus is uh, May 15th, and I believe you can buy uh, May 16th because uh, not, I think you can buy in the pop up stores. There's a pop up store in New York, there will be one in London, a few like in, in, I think in New Delhi, a few other places. So they're doing a smaller launch, but at least people can have access to the phone at some yeah. level. And I think it's two weeks later that they will probably have it uh, available on their website. So Again, that's another competitor. And then we have HTC at the end of the month, who, uh, from all rumors, is looking to launch as quick as possible as well to say, hey, here's our phone, and then let's move on. I really don't understand what the, what, what the reasoning in releasing what is supposed to be a flagship device and not having a release date for it. I, I don't get that. Like, what's, what's well, the, what could be the possible reason behind that? We, I, we can't figure it out because LG keeps doing this. And it keeps burning them. And you would think at some point an executive at LG would say, let's change our behavior. Let's not let's not go to announce until we have these things answered. But they've been doing this since the G5. Just nebulous sort of here's the phone and uh, oh, yeah, it's going to have these cool accessories that you will probably never be able to buy. And we're not sure exactly what features are going to go to what markets, because for some reason we have to build different phones for different regions and and eventually you can put one in your hands but by the time you can you'll have already forgotten that we exist because a whole bunch of other devices will have actually launched in the interim the worst was still i think the v20 uh they 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 worked so hard to beat the iphone announcement by a day and then it was like six weeks before there was actual information on the phone's availability and price and like that's that's not okay. I don't understand how they can keep looking at that that pattern and not see that this is one of the big things that dooms the phone before people even get a chance to play with it. Yeah. Um, or anything? Uh, I mean, I think everyone said pretty much what needs to be said here when it comes to uh, LG and how they release phones. I mean, they'll put it out. We'll get we'll get this weird preview release slash thing they do, and then we'll have to wait and see if we see it come to light. And I, they've done this strategy now several times, and um, it hasn't worked for them, and they seem to continue to want to do this strategy. So I don't know. Wow. It's just it's just kind of huh. Well, speaking of strategies, Charter is changing theirs, and they're entering into the wireless business market. Thank you for that segue, Warren. Uh, Charter will be launching its own mobile service, uh, you know, uh, basically piggybacking on other carriers. Uh, pricing looks to be quite interesting as well. Um, we know Xfinity Mobile is available, but it's regional. Just a general thoughts. What do you guys think of uh, all these, you know, cable companies getting into the MVNO uh, wireless markets? What do you think? I Well, I mean, more competition is good. I guess I well with the Sprint merge. This is something we talked about on the Pocket Now podcast for a little while too. With Sprint and T-Mobile merging, I'll be curious to see if regulators get twitchy about the MVNO space because those two companies represent fifty-four percent of uh, prepaid yeah. um, cellular. So having more people leasing time on Sprint and T-Mobile networks. I wonder if that moves the needle on how regulators look at this as a possible uh, block to a merger. Will they force some kind of concessions or some kind of, you know, like having to split off certain types of businesses before the merger is approved? Um, but ultimately, yeah, having, you know, giving consumers a few more choices as to where they can get uh, coverage is ultimately a good thing. I'll just be curious to see how traditional isps leverage their influence over consumer bases you know like if you start offering ridiculous like you know like we were talking about at the top you know oh well if you've got your your cell phone your home phone your tv and your internet through us then you get this tier 
of ultimate speed. But if you don't, then you're only going to get this for your home phone and it's going to cost more for your cable TV package. It's when we start when we start looking at cable trying to reinforce and revive the bundle market where you have to bundle all of your services to get the the, the best quality of service, then I think that's going to be ultimately very bad for consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren, Sam, anything? It's, uh, I, I'm just really um, surprised by the price. Um, it's pretty cheap for the same <laughs> thing that they're offering on the same network because they're, they're going to be using a Verizon network. So on the Verizon network, the same cost or the, the same feature, Verizon, which charge you about $75 and Charter saying they're going to charge you 45 That's a huge savings there. So I, yeah. I wonder what kind of coverage or what tier Verizon is going to put them on because I, I don't see I guess it's going to be markets where where, where Verizon is really not a, uh, a presence. Well, but it's well, no, huge. I think it's mostly because they they these these models are like um, the, the, these models are more like a Project 5 style. So they're going to be pushing not only calls over the Verizon network, but they're going to be pushing calls and, and data over, the their, over their Wi-Fi hotspots as well, too. So it, it, with it being that way, I, I think that's why they could charge a little bit less because they feel that most likely you won't be on their network, on, on Verizon's network as often. So there's a certain tier or a certain amount of data or, or users that you're paying for for that. Plus, also, you know that this is targeted to charter customers, and charter isn't in every single yeah. uh, consumer location in the U.S. So, um, you know, places like Rhode Island and you know things like that, where charter is available, that's pretty much where a bulk of their consumers will be getting up with the breaking up the service. So, um, I think that makes sense. Speaking of uh, something that Sam's been waiting for, red hydrogen is being pushed to August. Mm -hmm. That's well. It's it's a it's a mixed well, bag, really right? He really set you up on that, Sam. He was like, "Ah, yeah. oh, well, red hydrogen thing." Oh, because I think the phone's gonna do pretty well. I actually, I'm actually kind of hopeful for this device. But it, it, to me, it, it's one of those things where it's been delayed what three times already, from Q1 to sometime in the summer to now I August. So the phone is. I, I still believe the phone's gonna come out, but now it's adding a new feature. And that's why they're delaying it. But I'm like, if you're adding new features, which is basically a, an additional camera module, why don't you just upgrade the damn chip? <laughs> you know, why don't you just upgrade it to the to the latest um, that Qualcomm has to offer? Because I think that's going to be the biggest handicap to this device. Um, but we'll see if, if this. I, I don't know what this four view video capture is going to look it like. It means you can look around the objects. He's using a holographic display, the same display that's the Nintendo. DS I don't understand how that. that's going to uh, how that's right. going to happen. Looking around an object. I don't it's, care about looking around an object. If I, want I don't to, know how that's going to happen, but we'll, we'll see. Just pick one of these. You can actually walk around the object and look at it and not even have to. This stuff like yeah, whatever. but e that doesn't that's that that's not like, a, a twelve hundred dollar smartphone. Look, that's look, not exciting. Look, it's Warren, only exciting Warren, when Warren a phone knows, costs more than a thousand dollars. Warren knows quite well that we faced our backlash of 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 three D on phones. You know, mm -hmm. print. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. So uh, I'm just I I don't I don't want to deal with that anymore. I don't even care about that. I, look, if they can provide a very 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 good camera module that upgrades it. That's mm -hmm. excellent. Whether it's front and back, fantastic. If this adds to your red experience as a red user, sure, because now you have a monitor that works with your red. That's fine. But don't mess around the display, man. Like, you but isn't the real news that they finally figured that people take selfies, so they added a front camera module? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it reads like to me. Yeah, 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 they probably didn't have one. <laughs> They're like, oh shit, we forgot people take selfies. Uh, yeah, front camera module. We yeah. gotta add that in. But we're gonna delay it and say it's because we're making the four view video capture awesome. <laughs> Speaking of front camera modules, as we move away from this, the HTC made its uh, announcement for its launch uh, of its device on the twenty. Nobody cares. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was said with such vitriol. So vitriol. Oh, speaking of French camera modules, the rumor is that they're having a dual camera set up in the front. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you all laughing because with, you all with, said the same with, thing with in your own head. You all with, just said the same thing. No, actually, no. After after LG's launch, I'd rather see what HTC has to offer. I mean, like, hey, you know, LG just. I'm about to be that customer. That. I'm about to be that customer. Is it a Galaxy? Is it a Galaxy? It's a OnePlus. How about Is it that? a Galaxy? It's a OnePlus. It's not a Galaxy. Just watch HTC change your line to the universe. Yeah, it's, it's not a Galaxy. It's a it's universe. A, yeah, we don't care about Vietnam and the universe. It's a Galaxy. And I'm just being, I'm being average consumer. And Samsung will say this is the quantum verse. Quantum <laughs> verse. <laughs> 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 exactly. Uh, but yeah, they announced. No, but I'm just joking there. They, they announced their phone. I mean, they, they sent out um, flyers for flyers. that. It showed breakdowns of the internals. Some people are saying. They didn't really say if they were having an event or not. They were just like, here. It's kind event. of like save the day. They were like yeah. save the day first. Um, the rumor for that device, though, is interesting. The front-facing camera is a dual camera setup with dual OIS as well, um, which is the first for a front-facing camera, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, Well, I mean, it, there have been plenty of dual front-facing cameras and plenty of OIS front-facing cameras, but never both. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. the first. I was right. Did you have to repeat that? I already said it, man. No, like, it was. Said, it was. You it was said being, e, you were correct. It was being specific. Oh, you God. were correct, but you were not specific about what it was that was unique and why you were correct. So yes. I needed to explain why you were correct. West Coast liberals, man. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, they're just they're a different kind of liberal exactly. than the East Coast liberal. <laughs> uh, it's all about the feels. The feels, yeah. So, um, and any thoughts of that? You guys are weird. Oh, really? I just went quiet. Then no, what was what was that about, man? That was that was uh, an unprovoked attack on all of us. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are weird, and you're being and you're being SJWs now. Way to go. <laughs> Well, when, when you say I'm weird, Warren, it makes me feel like trigger. You're not listening to me. <laughs> trigger, 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 trigger. All right, well, stop making fun of people who get triggered. I need I need an app that allows me to hang out to put the word triggered on anybody's head at any point in time when they start getting mad. They start spamming the trigger button. It'd be amazing. It'll be like uh, a, a, an Instagram filter. And when, when someone starts going on a rant, just like triggered, just like <laughs> popping up all over the place. <laughs> triggered. Uh, speaking of Galaxy, that uh, Warren was talking about Galaxy about a lot of Galaxy news or rumors. One is Samsung is definitely going with the fingerprint display under the Galaxy S10, but also it looks like it will come on the Galaxy Note 9. Now, yeah. Samsung is still deciding on who to. Uh, which manufacturers to go with, or they might go with all three, aka um, Qualcomm, Synaptix, and this one other company. I just can't remember uh, the name. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing was also the foldable display. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Who's the Boss did a video on this, which he he called it kind of useless because the rumor is that it's supposed to have three 3.5 inch displays, um, two internally like it, it's basically they're copying westworld in a sense to internally open it up and then one at the back i don't know how this is going to uh function but that is, that is so basically and now there are new rumors that said the galaxy s10 will launch in january and the foldable display. Every year, every year there's an announcement that the yeah, Galaxy yeah. is going to launch I know, in but the, because the foldable display will be showcased at mwc so All right, so that would mean that the, no, no, so we're, we're saying no, we're saying one is going to launch at MWC the foldable display, and the other is going to launch launch in January. But doesn't it make sense for the other to launch in February at um uh, at CES or something? Well, CES is January, so it means Galaxy S10. Oh yeah, January. January. Okay. Yeah. So to me, this this is the opposite. The foldable display will be showcased. I see, yes. yeah, that makes and sense. The Galaxy S10, which is your cash maker, will have we'll its, be at MWC. MWC with its own private events. I mean, I don't know who decided to. Yeah, do, do I think someone just press. probably read some internal <laughs> memos wrong or something. Yeah. Oh, that's slow. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Warren is just dark well, today. <laughs> Warren is just on a roll, you know? I mean, okay. That's, now, that's but I mean, like, so, so all of these things. I mean, this this is one of the things I was actually just speaking with a, a gadget company PR rep who will probably not appreciate it if I name him. But 
Isn't this there? one of the things that kind of sets up these expectations for tech companies in a way where we've talked a gadget to death and what we think it might be, but by the time we get a Samsung foldable display device, it's not going to resemble <laughs> Our dreams. what we've been imagining it's going to be. There are going to be compromises. It's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be this unicorn device. And when we get it, then people are going to be disappointed based on rumors or leaks that weren't really going to ever happen for that well, well the foldable display is from a patent so that's the closest thing that we have in terms right of the three i mean so i mean like yeah. you know you can you can go and patent you know like a phone with a neuro interface right now doesn't mean you're going to have one out in february sure i, I agree i you agree keep, you keep saying stuff about neuro interface yeah i know what's up have, have you read any bad. books recently no, 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 that no. talk about the neural Does interface kind of like something from um you know what, what's it called? Uh, yeah, locked it. in a book uh, called <laughs> Locked In. Have you read that recently I, I, or something? I, I, I'm, I'm even taking this back to like, just give me a giant big old hole and let me go Matrix style, like stab a spike in my brain or something. Uh -huh. Like, I, I, I'm I'm pretty much ready. I, not not necessarily that I want like, you know, plugs and ports and USB jacks in my face or anything, but like. I, I really want to see some company do something bold to move the needle on changing up the phone interface. I don't think foldable screens do that. I don't think foldable screens fix the problems we have with phones. I don't think they address the social issues that we have with phones. And I think they make devices more fragile, which is already a problem that I've got um, that our phones um, are becoming too fragile. Um, so anything else that would that would be more lifestyle discreet while still letting me keep, stay plugged into my data and services would be a huge move. But every company's too nervous to make the next Google Glass mistake. So we're just going to be in a holding pattern until someone does finally make something different. So yeah. in terms of like social issues, I don't care about that. I want my cool sci-fi looking foldable phone that I can you know, just showcase to my friends. That's what this phone is all about. $1,500 I, yeah. of showcasing this. Yeah, I, well, I'm 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 not impressed. I'm not impressed. Well, it, uh, I, I would I would say there might be a market. There might be a market for a foldable display for people who work, let's say, in construction. People who work in design. There might be I, uh, oh, an argument oh, for it. I I agree that we could see some benefits in in niche fields, but you know, you say something like, "Well, I think there could be a market for a foldable phone," and then you say something like construction. And that's immediately one of the first red flags I would have with a foldable device is, will it be Rugged more durable yeah. than a tablet? You know, like, yeah. will yeah. it be more durable? I mean, because um, there, I actually linked to it a little while back. There was this great, like, um, uh, sit down interview on a YouTube channel that focused on uh, CAD construction and architecture and what they're doing to get HoloLens out into the field. And it's been a, a significant challenge because you don't have an OSHA approved face computer. So what are you wearing all these electronics on a site, you know, out in the field, you are engaging in a higher degree of risk. Cause what happens yeah. when there's an accident and you've got a face computer on, you've got like shards of glass in your face, uh -huh. if there's something bad that happens. So, you know, you start talking about foldable and I think, well, you know, just, just take an iPad or a surface. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it more and not in the actual, um, you know, going out and actually being one of the hands on uh, construction workers, but in the planning phases, it, it will be interesting to see how you incorporate something that could easily just be folded away when you're talking about being mobile, like someone, uh, one of a, so, someone who does a lot of project management or planning and just being mobile in that sense, you know, going out and unfolding a, a phone and looking at a full 3D mock-up of something yeah. that's about to be installed. There might be use cases like that, but for the general public, which a lot of these phones need to attract in order to be successful, I don't see it. So that's the problem, right? For a niche market, it's gonna be fine. But for a general public use, it's just, it's basically useless. So well, and and it's it's we're addressing for, for those niche markets. They don't want that. They, they don't. Sure. They don't want a foldable, more fragile device. That that's why we're seeing them try and embrace things like AR and VR. Because why why have something that's going to occupy my hands when I'm trying to like you know I, I have to unfold it and then how does it stay rigid and how is it going to handle a drop or a fall or some kind of impact? And it's still not as good as my Surface or my iPad. And at the same time, I want to be able to interact with the model in real space in real time. AR. 
is the perfect solution for that. So they're they're rapidly trying to find hands free, fully world immersive ways to interact with with this data. Well, and I agree with Jonathan Jones. Consumers. Jonathan Jones goes on. Stop being sensible. It's all about the oh, damn cool damn factor, true. man. <laughs> well, that's the thing. That I, don't, so I, true. Think, I, I don't think this moves the needle on cool factor. I think what moves the needle on cool factor would be like what Intel was doing with Vaunt. You know, like that that to me is 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 light years ahead, cool factor wise. Laser projectors that just beam information directly into the back of my eye is so much cooler than, well, look, I can watch a video with these seams cutting up my display because it yeah. can fold up is not yeah, I, cool to me that's I, 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 I am all for bio modifications or uh, basically just body modifications that actually are effective that would be really cool to see in the future but until we get there i i, I am more for sense I, I don't like body modifications man I, I know you guys like it i like seeing it in sci-fi anything that's hackable in my body no so, well, we just have to get our encryption into, you it's know. It's never going to be perfect. It's never. Oh well, you, if, 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 well you, if you get quantum terrible... computing working pa perfectly, it could be. And well, it's saying... also a terrible argument not to do it. It's like, well, you know, it's never going to be no, perfect. No, no, no. So I, I guess said, we'll I just said, do I, nothing. I don't want it. I didn't say we shouldn't do it. <laughs> I said I don't. I would be. And, 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 and I'm not talking about doing it for cosmetics' uh, sake. I'm no, talking I'm not talking about, about cosmetics. I'm just saying it. Or just, just imagine. Okay, so the, why I was referencing uh, what Juan was saying. So I can use my hand. Johnny Mnemonic. So there was a there's a book. If you guys get a chance, please pick up this book called Locked In. It is actually read by Will Wheaton and. I think it's written written by uh, what's the, who, who's the writer on this? John Scalzi. John Scalzi writes this. Literally, the whole concept is there's a huge viral um, attack, a huge viral um, disease outbreak, and then there are people who are literally locked in. They they have working brains like you and me. They can think, they can feel, but they cannot connect with their body. So we have to wow. figure out a way to get these people to live normal lives. And they turn out to basically install neural networks in their brain. And I think it's really fascinating when you start looking at things that we're doing now when it comes to prosthetics um, and, and connecting prosthetics to the brain. And you look at what this book is talking about, putting a neural network in the brain. And basically, instead of having a single prosthetic, a robot becomes your prosthetic. A whole body is your prosthetic, and you're moving around, and you're doing these things. It becomes, you know, it's it's just the whole idea of where can we get to if we focus on giving people who don't have the same ability as you or myself the the, the ability now to go out and live their lives in just as good, if not better, a way than we do. I, I think it just totally opens up technology in a very different way. Just imagine if, if if we start out with someone who can't hear and we can now install some kind of hearing aid that has antennas into your ear canal. And all of a sudden, what does that mean later on when we're talking about cell phones? Maybe our cell phones become these little pods that we can just put on our ear and we can take calls and not our heads to take calls and, and just be total hands free. It, it becomes really amazing when we start looking at things like that. I get, I really geek out on stuff like that. But yeah, that's that's what I was thinking when you were talking about like neural networks. I'm like, oh damn, this is really cool if they can do it. Look, Jonathan was right. I still need to show people cool stuff. And uh, this as as soon as you works. start sporting a, a foldable phone and acting like that's like really hot, I'm going to mock you so ruthlessly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice taco phone. That's, that's right. That is that is absolutely. I can see that because taco it's phone. Cinco de Mayo and <laughs> my people. Oh yes, it is Cinco de Mayo today. Oh, I wonder if Google cool. has anything for Cinco de Mayo, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like man. last year. <laughs> Oh wow! What it's shirt also, is that? Because it's also Revenge of Revenge of the Fifth. So. Can, yeah. can you can you show us the shirt again? Nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this shirt literally only works one day a year. So. <laughs> well, I, I saw an image with someone dressed like a stormtrooper, but then he had like a sombrero. <laughs> 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 like okay, that that's really mel melding both these days. It's 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 only you know because again it's it's like Jedi culture appropriation, so it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, speaking of uh, movies, Movie Pass has a competitor coming to the U.S. or at least expanding the U.S. Cinema offers movie plans starting at five dollars and without the restrictions or limited restrictions that you've had for movie pass so the pricing is as follows at 4.99 on an annual plan moviegoers in the us uk and canada australia 
get one ticket uh, per month to any 2D traditional movie. Um, and then for $6.99, you can get two tickets per month. Uh, you would like to see any additional movies in 3D or mixed, then you move to the $9.99 plan. And then for $14.99, you get three tickets per month, either 3D, IMAX, doesn't matter. Because Movie Pass is also taking away that one movie per week. It's now, what, four movies? Uh, I know. I think um, Movie Pass brought that, um, they brought that feature back. Did yeah, they? they brought back the, mo the yeah. one movie a day. Okay. Ah. Because, probably because of the fact that they had, <laughs> they were getting competitors. <laughs> okay. All right. That's uh, it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that actually came back. So at least there's comp competition in this space. Um, but even any of these plans, to be honest, any of these plans are still really good. You know, yeah. uh, even if it's the four ninety nine plan, I mean, like, you, if you ask yourself how many movies do you watch a year, and you're like, you know, if you're a superhero fan, you go, it's this, or if these, I'm, I watch ten movies, then you're like, I've, I'm covered, I'm good, you know. Yeah, you, it's basically like going to Costco and getting. Uh, they they sell like those AMC gift passes where yeah. it essentially just cuts your movie price in half. I mean. Yeah. It's the same thing. You're basically just buying. You're you're pre buying a, a half price, or in some like in our neck of the woods, it's quarter third price, price. Yeah. quarter price. Yeah, yeah. Um, depending on where you go to see your movies, it's a third to a quarter price ticket. So that's fine. I, I, I'll be curious to see what the sustainability of this business model is if they can't work out some kind of preferred bulk rate with movie theater owners because every movie theater out here is trying to create its own club system mm -hmm. you know you you pay for a club fee and then you get certain perks with so many movies coming out and mm -hmm. it, it's it's too much like we we actually let our arc light membership lapse because well with a kid we weren't using it enough but they changed up the structure on how points worked and then it's like well it's going to be so much more effort the way we see movies to get our free movies or our free concessions why, why even bother trying to keep track of it? It's not even worth the time to try and keep track of those points for how we're seeing movies now. So I, I think if they can crack the nut on getting theater owners to cooperate and make these at least break even on the ticket purchases themselves, um, they'll be in this weird limbo where they'll add perks, they'll take perks away until they get something that sticks. Well, the cinema, or whatever it's called, allows you to actually book your tickets ahead of time and yeah. have selected seating, which Movie Pass does not. So, Movie Pass allows you to buy the ticket the day of, or I think, or I think either day of or day before, if I'm not mistaken. This allows you to, you know, uh, pre-order your tickets and then select your seat. So, uh -huh. it's, at least as good as competition in, in that arena, and. Um, We'll see how it turns out for. But I'm honestly surprised that AMC hasn't done something similar. I know, like AMC is the largest, and they can easily do this. They already oh. have the system with the AMC points. Yeah, and you can actually just oh my. Ah. Yeah, we keep giving them ideas, huh? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, but I mean, think about it. Let, let's let's just flip this to the early days of Netflix. You know, when when we were still getting DVDs in the mail and little red envelopes. <laughs> Like that was the thing. It's hilarious how, how, you know, it wasn't that long ago where this was like a hot new disruptive business. <laughs> yeah. um, Man, I remember we, we used to have to pedal that at Best Buy to, to get right? people to sign up on that for the script. So, I, I thought I thought sending them DVDs was stupid back then. <laughs> I thought it was dumb. I was like, we got to fast enough that we could stream some 480p across here. Like, come mm -hmm. on now. Like, yeah, but, like but, it, but it got people moving. And that's it got it. people moving. Now, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, Blockbuster and renting movies were still a thing. What what I'm absolutely shocked by is Blockbuster never having done an in-store Netflix. You pay us, you know, $19.99 a month. And if you want to watch 15 movies in one day, you can keep coming back to Blockbuster on the day and just swapping out DVDs for whatever it is you want. You want to watch an entire show? <laughs> You know, like from season one to season 10, all in one day, just keep coming back and just keep exchanging yeah. the DVDs. I was shocked that yeah, but they didn't see one start because it could have crushed well, Netflix well, on day one. Well, well, the, fuck, one the problem is the, Blockbuster was a bigger corporation. And to make a decision like that will probably take as long as it took for Netflix to basically just. I also have experience in not working with Blockbuster. I worked for one of the competitors as one of my early jobs. And that is such a different product model 
based on how they structure video stores that would it, yeah. would, it would it would it would it would have been too much for them to try and do that because in the end it's it's also based on limited supply because Netflix has an unlimited supply of a warehouse to sit back to ship those DVDs over a period of time yeah. where in a store you don't necessarily have that and then you also have the 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 issue with what comes back might be damaged might not be playable there mm -hmm. might be some type of issue with oh, it I'm I'm not saying there wouldn't have been challenges and they would have definitely had to have stepped up stock and distribution, but you also had the advantage of having a ton of mini warehouses. You know, it's the same thing like Apple stores, you know, support and repair for Apple products are way better in areas that have more than two or more than one uh, Apple stores because they use those as warehouse space for how they they package and ship and uh, fulfill consumer demand. So I'm not saying that it would have just been like you flip the switch and it would have been easy, but who would have had the infrastructure, the network, the support, the the relationship with distributors to get content and to get product? Remember, Netflix was even for a while having to buy retail DVDs that Blockbuster and other video stores were trying to push them out of the business by leveraging those relationships. Yeah. And instead of leveraging them to their own benefit, they were leveraging those relationships to try and halt competition yeah. again. If, if they had just shifted that perspective to how can we make a better service as opposed to how can we halt another competitor, then I think Best Buy would still be around today. And yeah, that's why I'm shocked that AMC. Yeah. Just, just, Best I Buy just realized that is still around. Your, your, your kid would never know what a VHS tape was. Well, my kid oh, doesn't, wow. doesn't, my, my kid doesn't <laughs> understand the concept of spinning plastic discs. Damn. She 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 watches movies. She has some of her favorite films. She knows they're in the TV. None of my nieces or nephews were born when VHSs were still a thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. God in and, think, and, think, and that's only like fifteen years ago. <laughs> and, and think about how cool that tech is. I mean, you can you can pull out a VHS from like thirty years ago, and it's still going to remember where you left off. So <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> Do you want to continue so playback? To you, also, you also have to think about like how that was a thing, but then also how small that was a thing, depending on when. You, like, I, I remember DVDs coming out in '99. But I remember watching probably VHSs for maybe in the 90s because that was kind of the only option at the time. But that technology had been around a long for a pretty long period of, a period of time before the DVD had come out. Lazy disc. Interesting. That doesn't exist. I so, know. <laughs> that was that was. I remember that was the rage when um, a, like our version of Best Buy in Nigeria brought Lazy Disc. We're like, whoa. You know, yeah, and you told us how hard it was. Like, you know, you couldn't put it in the backseat of the car. You couldn't touch it. All these things. And then, like, when somebody just touched the lazy disc, you just got pissed. You're like, you destroyed it. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were very literally Nigerian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, but it's just interesting. interesting like, um, like, from VHS to DVD. And it's like, I remember watching VHS, but that was realistically a small period of time before I really just switched to DVD quick, and then quick question then, what was the last VHS movie you guys remember watching the last VHS movie I remember watching uh just because I watched that movie way too much uh I was a big Robocop fan and oh, uh, but even though that's not the last one the only reason I remember it was this is earlier it was Robocop and in that copy this is when did Robocop come out 89 I think or something like that. Uh, my yeah. friend had dubbed Fist of the North Star on there. Oh. I had never seen that anime. And uh, you know how you watch VHS, the credits go, it just keeps playing. And next to me, I just hear, Hokdushin Ken. I was like, what is this? <laughs> I was like, this is absolutely perfect. And that's how I that's how I got into this anime. Like, wow. Know. I, I think so, yeah. the, being in America was all the damn Disney, the Disney ones. Oh. Uh, like the, the series of all, remember the, Juan, you remember the big plastic uh, oh, yeah. Disney covers? Recovered from the Disney vault. The vault. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they made it such like a, it looked like a book. Everyone mm -hmm. came out sort of like a book style. And that big puppy plastic, it was all wrapped yeah. around the sides. Yeah. Then, then you obviously had Cop and a Half, Angels in the Outfield, Rookie of the Year, and some yeah. Freedom's Damn movie. And that was your set. 
everyone had the same damn set. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think my last VHS was uh, when I, I made my wife watch Evil Dead 2 for the first time. <laughs> I, I didn't, I, 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 and I remember this distinctly. It was, uh, so it was our third year of college. Um, so I, I like, we were just talking about different movies and stuff and you're like, you've got to watch Evil Dead. It's the best combination of like horror and comedy. So we sit down, we watch it. And literally, I, I, I want to say in my brain, it's the next day, but it was probably a week or two after is when I got my first DVD player. And one of the first DVDs my wife got me was Evil Dead 2. <laughs> so so that, that, that literally, I mean, just because it was such a, a happy memory between my wife and I sharing that movie. And then she, she like totally like replaced it for me because we got this DVD yeah. player. We're, we're so high tech now. Uh, um, that, that literally killed my VHS collection in one week. Collection was the big thing because I remember at my house, we had a wall dedicated. Yeah. Not at my house, but at my we grandma's house. A wall library dedicated. Yes. The and you had to you could buy roll those out. specific tapes yeah. so you could basically put it on the front of the VHS and yeah. write what movie it was because it yeah. gets like mm -hmm. worn out over time. Yeah. <laughs> And then I, then I remember it was a special thing. Like, I remember the one special thing was uh, if a kid's movies, if you got a Nickelodeon one, it was always an orange. Mm -hmm. always oh, yeah. A, always an orange if you got a Nick, a Nick, a Nick, uh, Nickelodeon movie. Yeah, um, Lou, Lou, you're right. Um, my last set of VHSs I watched was in college. Of course, I'm dating myself a long time ago. At 1999, didn't even uh, have a, didn't and it was a VHS player in the college. It was all Dragon Ball Z, and we got Dragon Ball Z dubbed. Uh, we got Dragon Ball Z subtitled, and we got Dragon Ball Z with no subtitles whatsoever. To a certain point where I thought I, I understood Japanese because I watched at least 50 episodes of Dragon Ball Z without any subtitles. <laughs> and I, knew what was hey, like, I understand what's going I was on like, yeah, it's because just, you, you know the credit. Like yeah. half an episode, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the fight would take three episodes before it starts, yeah. and then the major bad guy shows up and Krillin dies within two seconds, and it's like, okay, let's keep going. Yeah, Did you guys ever use those uh, LP VHS uh, tapes? Because my my friend's mom uh, lived lived and worked in the U.S. a while, you know, so she would record all the Disney cartoons, the uh, you know. Saturday morning cartoons for us on those long LP, uh, like long play VHS tapes. Yeah, long play. Uh, and long then she would send it over to us like once every month, like just wow. record everything. So that's how Dude, that was. That, that was how a lot of Nigerian movie um, mm -hmm. rentals uh, made business. A bunch of people just sent movies that they recorded off a of TV from here and just yeah. sent them back home, and that was like eighty percent of the <laughs> of the movies we were so, watching. So you guys, so you rentals. guys had it, it's a wonderful life too. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, oh, yeah. yeah, we had all this stuff. Um, uh, I remember one of the one of the last VHSs I watched because this is like a family thing. It was uh, Sound of Music. We've had oh, at least two yeah. Yeah, yeah, versions amazing. of that. Remember, they used so, to come in a big, thick disc. Yeah, set. yeah, <laughs> crazy. I, I think it was uh, what was it like Warner or whatever, like W, whatever it was, was or Lion TV. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was really, um, really, really. Uh, one of the it really throws me back every time I uh, I think about Sound of Music. I don't think about Sound of Music as a DVD. I always think of it as a VHS because that's always the only way I've ever watched it is VHS. Yeah, that's true. VHSs. Mm. Well, that's that's a good trip to memory lane, guys. Thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> for right. that. I appreciate all the. Uh, all I got to take off, guys. All right. All right. Uh, all right, Warren. I'll let you guys later. I later. Right. Um, but yeah, we've come to the end of the show, and uh, again, happy Cinco de Mayo. If you're celebrating, do that safely today. Uh, tacos, mezcal, you know, it'll be fun. Yeah, um, do do it upright, do it up safe. Make sure you've got your your Uber and Lyft apps ready to go, and just you know, uh, this this is again, it's it's like for um, St. Patrick's Day. Those of us of the flavor of that holiday typically don't hit this too hard because all the lightweights are out. I would give people one good uh, advice. If you're going to be drinking mezcal, check out, if you can get your hands on this, check out something called Chichicapa. It's a really nice oh, mezcal. It's so it's good. It's so a I'm, really tasty mezcal. I'm going to be keeping it simple. I've, I've got a really nice bottle of Don Julio, and I'm just going to toast tonight and keep it keep it nice and simple after Lex goes to bed. So, uh, yeah. I, again, we don't want to hear any horror stories from, from our, our friends, our tech friends out there of bad shenanigans on Cinco de Mayo. So have fun, be safe, and, you know, do crazy silly things, but crazy silly things that won't get you killed. Exactly.
That's a great advice. <laughs> And just you remember your oobs, your your um, Lyft, Uber, your Lyft, yeah, your Junos, Juno, yeah. which, whichever ride sharing app or friend, yeah, have have just have that ready. Drink um, responsibly, people. Drink yes. responsibly. And on that note, we just want to quickly mention what we have on the channels, what we can expect next week. So, Juan, why don't you kick it off? Oh yeah, of course. So um, this week on New Egg Now, this last Thursday, we had some great interviews. Uh, we we talked to Intel about the new 905P Optane uh, that's coming out, bigger storage for their new 3D crosspoint uh, storage tech. Uh, we talked to Corsair about some cool RGB kit, and I nerded out hard on a, a rep from Creative, and uh, so hard in fact that they sent me home with a Creative K3 Plus. This is a, a, a an insane little audio interface, which while it's built for desktop and streaming and it's got a soundboard and a vocoder, not a vocoder, uh, an auto tuner and all this crazy stuff that's karaoke style, it's also built to support phones. So you could take this out as like a field mixer for a phone to run your podcast off of oh, mobile kit nice. from a tablet or a phone. So it, absolutely insane. And of course, during the episode, uh, it's like everything I can do to res restrain just not nerding, like <laughs> slobbering all over him uh, while we're talking about audio kit. And speaking of audio kit, I did publish. It's currently in preview on Patreon, but it will be live hopefully tomorrow as I'm waiting for YouTube to fix my demonetization again. Um, I, I have a, a review coming out on a portable mic called the Mic Me, which is taking the same type of diaphragm that we would use in a, in a studio grade mic and it's putting it into this really rugged enclosure so that you can go and do field recordings or mobile podcasting or vlogging. For iOS users, there's an app where you can actually use it for your video. Unfortunately, Android users don't get that. But again, it's another step in this direction where we've got all of these really awesome um, mobile audio uh, solutions that can really step up the sound part of your content creation, content production. So hopefully that'll be that'll be live on my YouTube channel tomorrow once I see if it'll be approved for monetization because talking about microphones on YouTube is probably the most controversial thing you could do for advertisers. Um, and then after that, uh, I did finish up my Honor View 10 camera review. So that is also now uh, live on Patreon. My camera and audio reviews for phones will be Patreon exclusives moving forward. So if you want to help support production on that channel, help abbreviate the timeline for getting new phones, getting new reviews out there, that's where I'm going to be building that new community. So I've got the full in-depth camera deep dive on the Honor View 10, which is pretty surprising for a phone that comes in at 500 bucks. All right, cool. Uh, on our end, it's pretty simple. We had our spoiler review of Infinity War. If you want to check out our conversation, it was like an hour... 37 minutes, so almost half as long as the movie, or maybe slightly longer. Um, and uh, we also had our Westworld uh, Season 2, Episode 2 uh, review, uh, reunion. Westworld, of course, is is that show that slowly builds up to you know its, its, its climax, so it's going to be fun to check that out. And then we have two videos on the LG G7 ThinQ. Uh, one is... You're our welcome. <laughs> when is our hands on all you need to know give me a breakdown of everything that's in the phone it still has it has a quad DAC which is great it also has DTX headphone X um, for 3D surround sound and that has to do if you're gaming for, for more anything else on your phone uh, and also has a a boombox speaker. Uh, and so we did a test on that speaker to see how well it sounds putting through different scenarios and cases and things like that. So we'll have that. Next week, we will have our rev review of the Samsung Q9 FTV. Also, we should have our review of the Sony a7 III. We should also have another PC build video for you. I can mention that we should also have something else from LG G7. Most likely, we only have two videos out of all those four. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> a couple of those might will, will probably hit up uh, on the channel so thank you very much guys appreciate uh joining us i apologize i haven't updated the podcast if you are listening i will update it this weekend so you have the last three episodes up there so don't forget to like and share subscribe to all the channels mr warren woman at bw1.com um of course find Magnell at uh, some gadget guy and uh, Sam, follow him on tw uh, not Twitter, yeah, um, Twitter, 
Twitter, yes. I would say uh, Instagram. Black Iron <laughs> underscore man. <laughs> yeah. And myself, it's it's for the work on on YouTube. So thank you very much. And uh always enjoy your entertainment. Bam. Ooh.